This is for the Ethics Review class at Parker University. We've been talking about business entities, and in this video I want to talk about buying and selling a business. And the important thing I want to emphasize about buying and selling a business is this type of transaction involves enough complexity and enough moving parts that this is a situation where you truly should be seeking professional advice and working with an attorney to make sure the transaction is completed uh, and that your rights are protected in the way it's completed. Uh, the first thing to think about when you're buying a business is to think about just exactly what are you buying. Uh, the first decision is are you just buying the, the assets of the business, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, or are you buying an ownership interest in the business? If it's a corporation or an LLC, are you buying that business entity? There can be a big difference between whether you're buying the assets or the business entity. If you purchase the business entity, you are also purchasing or, or becoming subject to the liabilities of that business entity. Uh, just because ownership is transferred from one person to another does not mean that those liabilities go away. And if a lawsuit were to come up, say for uh, patient malpractice, uh, that becomes a burden or an obligation on the new owner or the assets that the new owner has invested in the business. So it may be to your best interest to purchase the assets, but there are also situations where it makes sense to purchase the business entity. But be aware that when you purchase the business entity, you may also be subjecting yourself to those liabilities and be sure you have appropriate indemnity clauses to protect you in those situations. Are you buying the employees? Of course not. You can't buy and sell employees. Uh, as you evaluate a business for purchase, if you realize that the employees who run the business are the real value of the business, you may want to be sure you talk to those employees and understand what their plans are and whether they're going to continue to work for you after you purchase the assets or the business entity. You also, of course, can't purchase the patients. When you're looking at purchasing a chiropractic practice, selecting a chiropractor is a very personal decision by a patient. And there's, uh, if you're very similar to the chiropractor who currently practices there, you may stand a better chance of keeping those patients. And by similar, I mean the way you practice is similar, your personality and character is similar. But the more differences there are between the way you practice in the way the current owner practices, the more likely it is that you're going to lose a number of patients. So keep in mind that you will lose some patients, uh, and, but you need to try to do what you can to minimize that loss. Work with the current owner as part of the transaction or part of the transition to involve them in introducing you to the patients so that the patients feel more comfortable with you. Uh, lease agreements, generally say they can't be assigned by the tenant. The tenant can't simply say, here's my new uh, 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 replacement. The landlord gets to approve whether the lease gets transferred to a new owner. So make sure you understand what the lease provides. If the lease is in default, if payments haven't been made or requirements of the lease haven't been met, then the uh, uh, lease may go away may also be that sometimes people are trying to sell a, a business because the lease is about to expire. And in that situation, it may or may not be possible to keep the business operating in the same location. Are you buying the business name or the right to use the business name? And same thing with phone numbers and websites associated with the business. If you're purchasing those assets, be sure they're clearly identified in what your rights are with respect to those assets. Uh, purchasing the receivables. Uh, generally, the receivables are not a very good uh, bargain. The person who has created the receivables tend to think they are much more valuable than they really are. And the person who is purchasing the receivables usually has trouble collecting those because sometimes patients think, well, if old Dr. Smith isn't trying to collect, I'm not going to worry too much about paying those receivables. Also keep in mind in a chiropractic practice that receivables that are very old, uh, 
And when I say very old, if they're more than 60 to 90 days past due, it may be very unlikely that you're ever going to collect anything on that receivable. Also think about the inventory. You know, what kind of supplies does the practice have? Is there a supply of uh, supplements or vitamins that the practice sells? What kind of uh, office supplies and, and face paper supplies, et cetera, are there that are important for you to purchase? Typically, the first document signed as part of buying a business is a letter of intent. The buyer expresses their intent to purchase the business and is asking for permission to conduct an examination to decide whether the business is, is a good purchase or not. Now, typically, a letter of intent is a non-binding agreement. But sometimes I have seen people write letters of intent on their own and they write them in such a way that it becomes a binding agreement. So it's not just a letter saying, I'm thinking about buying the practice and I want to conduct an investigation. It's a letter that says, I'm going to buy the practice and I'm going to buy it for this price. And that usually is not what you want to do before you've had a chance to investigate the business. So make sure the agreement is written in a way that's non-binding. Now, the parts of the agreement are probably going to be binding because parts of that letter of intent should also be an expression that the buyer or the potential buyer is not going to use the information uh, for any purpose other than deciding whether to buy the practice and that the buyer, as they gain access to confidential information, will not disclose that information to anybody else. Uh, some things to think about in conducting your investigation. Uh, number one, look at tax returns. Business owners have a tendency to exaggerate how healthy the business is. But one thing they don't do is exaggerate their income on tax returns. So the tax returns are likely to be an accurate reflection of how the business has been doing. If the seller does not have tax returns, or if the seller says the income reflected on the tax returns doesn't reflect all the income of the business, you probably want to get away from buying that business. It probably means the seller has been engaged in tax fraud and you just flat don't want to be involved in that. Uh, look at the financial records of the business. Uh, certainly part of what you want to look at are financial statements, profit and loss statements, or balance sheets. But you also want to look at the detail or help verify that that information is accurate. Look at bank statements. Uh, look at canceled checks. Look at credit card statements to be sure that they are inaccurate, that the financial statements uh, have some or are not misstating the, the uh, health of the business. Part of the, what you review ought to be a list of the assets and the liabilities, and that will help you decide what you're buying. Now, if you're buying an asset that is subject to a liability, Okay, for example, purchasing a computer system that's subject to an equipment lease. You can't buy the computer system and, and walk away from the computer lease or the equipment lease. They come together. They're tied together. So make sure you understand what those liabilities are that you're going to have to take care of as you purchase those assets. Uh, spend some time to look at the patient files. That'll help tell you how this doctor has been taking care of their patients, what kind of treatment they've been providing, uh, how they interact with their patients. There may be a few key contracts like the lease agreement that you want to review. Or if there's employment agreements with some of the employees, you may want to review those as well. Uh, spend some time talking to the key employees and help try to evaluate whether they're going to leave after you purchase the business. Uh, the Uniform Commercial Code has a system that creates a public record of liens. So, for example, if the seller has borrowed money from a bank, and the bank, in exchange for that or as part of that loan transaction, the bank has taken a collateral interest in all the furniture, fixtures, and equipment of the business, then the bank will file with the Secretary of State a UCC financing statement to report that lien. Uh, before purchasing a business, you want to conduct a lien search or have someone conduct it for you uh, for all possible names of the debtor. Uh, 
and that'll help you identify whether there are liens out there that cover the assets and to be sure those liens are satisfied when you take possession of those assets. It's also a good idea to conduct a search for lawsuits. Uh, chiropractic malpractice is pretty rare, but if the uh, seller has been subject to it, you certainly want to know about those situations. Uh, most likely you're going to run across collection lawsuits where the, where the seller of the business may not have been paying their bills. And that can tell you a lot as well about the financial health of the practice that you're buying. Once you've decided to buy the business, an agreement needs to be put together that reflects the transaction. And it needs to be a fairly thorough and complete uh, agreement. It needs to describe the assets clearly and specifically. Uh, it needs to represent that the person is transferring title to those assets to the, to the buyer. And if there are any liens that apply, whether they're being released as part of this transaction, or whether those liens are being, or whether the buyer is going to have to satisfy and pay off those liens. If the assets include equipment, uh, it may be a good idea to include a description about the condition of the equipment. Is it in good working order? Will it continue to work for any, is it guaranteed to continue to work for any particular period of time? Or does that become the buyer's responsibility as soon as the transaction closes? Agreement should also spell out exactly what the purchase price is and how that purchase price will be paid. If you were the buyer in this situation, you probably want to pay at least part of the purchase price out over time. That helps to give you some leverage to make sure the seller cooperates with the transition to the new owner. And it also gives you some leverage in case the seller does not fulfill all of their promises. The agreement should also include a covenant not to compete that prohibits the seller from opening a practice to compete with the one they're selling to you within a certain geographical territory and for a certain time period. If third party approval is required, uh, perhaps the landlord needs to approve the assignment of the lease, or perhaps the landlord or the city needs to approve new signage or renovations of the space need to be approved. That third party approval should be part of the agreement and the agreement should be contingent upon that third party approval. So for example, if a landlord is not going to approve the assignment of a lease, then you, the purchase of the business should not take place. Uh, if there's any specific provisions for the transition, what are going to be the seller's obligations after the sale? At a minimum, there should be some provision for notice to the patients. And I think it's helpful for that notice to go out with the signature of both the doctor selling the practice and the doctor who is buying the practice. So that the patients know that these two doctors are working together and that they can have some continuity. Uh, certainly there should at a minimum be a notice sent to the patients, both active patients and inactive patients, to let them know that their records are now in the possession of the new owner and that if they need their records, they should contact the new owner to get them. Uh, indemnity clauses. Uh, typically, the buyer of the business will require an indemnity clause so that if they're subjected to any liabilities for something the seller did prior to the transaction, then the seller should be responsible to indemnify and hold the buyer harmless. If either of the parties is using a business broker, that broker should be identified and provisions for the payment of that broker should be included. Uh, those brokers can be relatively aggressive if they don't get paid as part of the closing of the transaction. So the key here again is there's a fair number of moving parts. The agreements can be somewhat complicated. This is a situation where it does make sense to seek professional advice and it does make sense to spend a little bit of money for that professional advice for your protection and the protection of the other parties to the transaction.